وأفضل الصلاة وأكمل التسليم على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين ورضي الله عن أصحابه أجمعين وعنا معهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين أما بعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته In talking about al-Imam al-Ghazali رحمه الله تعالى ورضي عنه وهو حجة الإسلام The one the most famous scholar that was called حجة الإسلام رحمه الله تعالى We're talking about a personality that combined leadership in four different areas among them the first philosophy and al-Imam al-Ghazali رحمه الله تعالى was a philosopher of the first level. The second was a faqih, and he was a faqih of the highest rank. And the second, or the third, was a Sufi from tasawwuf and spirituality, tazkiyah, or ihsan. And the fourth one was usul, and he was an usuli of the first rank as well. Al-Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, was able to put all those four different all these four different kinds of knowledge into a framework in which reflected his profound knowledge and his intellectual maturity and the basira that he has and the illumination with the righteous thought so he became a leader of all four of them al imam abu hamid bin muhammad al ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala was born in Ghazala or in a place in Tus and Tus is somewhere in Khurasan where Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala was born he was born around year 450 of Hijrah so uh, knowing from that you see where Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah and then you see how long he lived and how much he gave he was born to a father who used to do the selling of suf or uh, wool. So he used to have this, uh, you know, making of wool, ghazl, we call it, it's called in Arabic. So they said to him, he was attributed as ghazali. Like his father was a poor man and he was only able to spend a little money. He had a brother, his name is Ahmed. Ahmed and Muhammad, both, right? And uh, when his father died, he uh, had another Sufi friend of his, the father of Imam Ghazali, who he told him, I have just a little money, I'm going to give you my money, and then you take my son, and you raise my son, and you teach him. Though his father was not learned, but he loved knowledge very much, so that he wanted his son to learn, he died when Imam Ghazali was still at a young age and that man, the friend of his father, took him in and spent the money that his father left for him and his brother. But that money was not much, so eventually that man had to put him in a boarding school where Imam Ghazali was learning. Obviously, uh, Imam Ghazali went and traveled and he uh, learned from many scholars after that. He grew up with this kind of environment, very difficult as you see. And he learned from Imam Razkani, rahimahullah ta'ala. And then he took from Imam Abu Nasr al-Ismaili, rahimahullah ta'ala. Then he went to Tus, uh, he went to Naysabur uh, a little bit. And from Naysabur, uh, obviously, or in Naysabur, he went to Al-Madrasa Al-Nidhamiyya. Madrasa Nidamiya was the school where the Imam Abu Al-Ma'ali Al-Juwaini, who is known as Imam Al-Haramain, was. He stayed in that Madrasa Nidamiya by Abu Al with Abu Al-Ma'ali. And Imam Abu Al-Ma'ali, as you know, was an Imam in Aqaid and an Imam in Usul and a Faqih, etc. And the Imam Al-Juwaini, rahimahullah ta'ala, was an ocean that gave, well, Imam Al-Ghazali stayed with him until and he stayed in Naysabur and that's where he got married Imam Ghazali got married and had had children and he stayed there until the year 478 of Hijrah so he was born 450 478 he stayed 
and that's the year where Imam al Juwaini rahimahullah ta'ala passed away and died. So Imam Ghazali stayed there. Al Imam al Juwaini, his teacher used to call him Bahr, an ocean. So al Juwaini rahimahullah used to uh, talk to him about like that. Al Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala, obviously, after Al Imam al Juwaini uh, died in around the year 478, so. He was at that time 20 years old, only Al-Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala. He left Naysabur. When he left Naysabur, he went to, uh, uh, the, to follow one of the wazirs at that time, the minister is Nidham al-Mulk. And Nidham al-Mulk was a minister for the Saljuqi uh, 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 system regime that was leading at that time. And he used to love scholars. So he went there, and Nidham al-Mulk, the wazir or the minister, he appointed him to do teaching in the Nidami Madrasa, Madrasa Nidamiya in Baghdad. So he went there in year uh, 484, I believe, something like that. And that's where Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, started in the Madrasa Nidamiya in Baghdad. He used to have so many people with him uh, that uh, he became very known, very famous, especially with Munadhara debates. He used to debate. He tried to look for the truth, and at that time there were three kinds of groups, the philosophers, they were the people of Kalam, and they were the Sufis that were very sort of prominent. And Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala tried to see and verify the truth in every group and tried to see uh, what they have. Throughout his search and his verification of everyone's saying, he sort of wrote his beautiful book, Al Munqidhu Min Al Dalal, The Saving from Misguidance. And that book is, is great, and that's really the summary of the experience of Imam al Ghazali with all these groups. Um, but he came out of this uh, experience abandoning teaching, as if this experience with all those groups made him abandon teaching and not like teaching, sort of, and forgetting, and he abandoned the debate and the munadharas and all these things that he used to do. In fact, not only that, uh, he remained uh, for about six months like that, then he decided to leave Baghdad altogether. Not only that, all the money he gained from being a teacher in that madrasa nidamiya fi Baghdad, he spent it all uh, on the people, on the needy people, and he only left very little bit. So he can just survive by himself. And then immediately went or decided to take a journey to a sham, Damascus. He stayed there about two years in Damascus. Most of the time he stayed it, he stayed in Damascus in the, the Umawi Masjid, the Masjid of Bani Umayyah, doing khalwa, doing uh, seclusion, spiritual exercises. Uh, and uh, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Basically, no teaching, but spiritual exercises. The two years after that, he went from Damascus, he went to Bayt al-Maqdis, to Jerusalem. And in that, in Bayt al-Maqdis, he did the same thing. It was not a journey for teaching, as much as it was a journey for his own spiritual improvement and seclusion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for contemplation and tafakkur. In Bayt al-Maqdis, in Jerusalem, where he went, that's where he started, after Damascus, that's where he started writing his book, Ihya Ulum al-Din. The revival of the ulum of the deen. The revival of the sciences of the deen. Obviously he started there, but then he went back to Damascus from Jerusalem until, and he stayed there in Atikaf almost all the time uh, in the Umawi Masjid there, in the western wing of the Umawi Masjid, until he went to Mecca. And he went to Mecca about year 489 to do Hajj. Imam Ghazali returned back from Mecca and Medina, back to Asham, to Damascus, again to continue the book of Ihya, where he started in Jerusalem. The year after, he stayed about a year there in, in Dimashq, in Fisham, and then a year after that he went to Baghdad. So he moved to Baghdad. But again, he went to Baghdad not to continue or resume teaching. He still wanted to do the seclusion and at the same time do something that enables him to earn a living with him and, and his children, obviously. 
throughout these basically years after he stopped teaching, from the first time of leaving Baghdad till the time of going back to Baghdad, that's basically where he uh, wanted to keep his time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and went to the stazkiya and self-purification and purification of the heart until he reached a, a level where he sort of found that tasawwuf or Sufism may, means really the maqam of ihsan which means that you worship Allah as if you are seeing him though you don't see him but he sh surely sees you he saw that as the level of ihsan that everyone is uh, ought to go to and that this is the core of Islam really when uh, Fakhr al-Mulk Ali ibn Nidham al-Mulk became the wazir, became a minister in Naysabur that was about a, a year 498 Imam Ghazali was 48 years old at that time uh, he called Imam Ghazali he became a minister in Naysabur basically the assistant of the king and he called Imam Ghazali in Naysabur and he asked him to return back to teaching in the madrasa and the Nizamiya madrasa Nizamiya of, of Nizamiya of Naysabur but unfortunately the king uh, or the minister uh, Fakhr al-Mulk only lived two years he was killed eventually about year 500 by at that time they had problems between them and the Ismaili Shias so the one of, supposedly one of the Ismailis at that time then uh, stabbed that uh, wazir or that minister and killed him once that minister was killed Imam Ghazali stopped teaching again as if he was doing it because that uh, minister loved him so much and wanted him to do it when that minister died, then Imam Ghazali stopped teaching and he went back from now Naysabur, he went back to Tus. Tus is again his, his hometown and he built there a place uh, for, his, for his students, only those who uh, come to him and he remained there until he died. Al-Ghazali, uh, Imam Ghazali, we have to, to understand him, we have to understand how he lived and what he experienced. He experienced all these different groupings, fighting each other, calling each other names, and everyone saying that I have the truth, etc. So he tried to understand the understandings of all, each and every group that was there, and then he came and sort of put, put that in one, uh, in one thing, in, in, for example, where he came to the heart of, the, of, the, of this religion, which is Ihsan after Islam and after Iman. You see him, Imam Ghazali, as a Sufi, but he was not, was not a Sufi that was isolated or isolated himself from the problems of his community or his society. In fact, he was dealing with them and he actually was always following the ideological evolutions of every group and trying to refute that in a good way. So he sort of combined the ruhaniya of tasawwuf or the spirituality of tasawwuf and then also the academic in knowledge along with the freedom of thought that he very much exercised al-ghazali you see him uh, very concerned about the deen uh, and very concerned about the people that's why he wrote his book al-munqidh min al-dalal the save the save the saving from misguidance he wrote another book fada'ih al batiniya uh, about the Batanis and he wrote a book about Tahafut al falasifa Remember, before he wrote the book Tahafut al falasifa which means the falling of philosophers, he wrote a book called Maqasid al falasifa which means the objectives of philosophers. And that means he really knew what he was, what they were talking about, and he pointed out their problems that he saw. He was balanced before he refuted them he knew everything that they were about and that's a very rare thing nowadays that you put yourself in your opponent's shoes before you uh, make judgment on them in fact you articulate your opponent's points as well as you can articulate your own then you can then distinguish and refute uh, not the, uh, the mass confusion and chaos like you see in some sometimes. So here he wrote the Maqasid, then he wrote the Tahafut, and then obviously he put his heart and soul in the book that was that he named as the Ihya, the reviver of the knowledge of the Deen. From the name of the book, you can feel 
that al Imam al Ghazali felt that he needs to revive the ulum of the deen. So you can see that he really, his objective was to be or to fulfill the role of the mujaddid, of the reviver of the deen in the 5th century in a sense. And that's why he named this book the way he named it. Obviously, when he talked about the philosophers, he talked about their problems. The problems that he saw, he did not simply uh, criticize. And you see him in his criticism is a very academic and it's very honest. It's very open and obviously it's very honorable criticism, constructive. Al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala and his philosophy approach was based on two things, intuition and doubt. And therefore, he used to always say, uh, without a doubt there is no research and without research there is no uh, verification and without verification there is blindness and misguidance. This is sort of uh, the, the foundation of his philosophy and you see that uh, this is how he started with his book al munqid min al-Dalal rahimahullah ta'ala and therefore you see the French philosopher Descartes following that uh, basically principle uh, Imam Ghazali was really the teacher of Descartes if, if you can really say so then you see uh, his stand with reason the school of Imam Ghazali was a combination of both he figured that there has to be spirituality, there has to be academic knowledge of the deen, and there also should not be a disabling of the mind, of the reason. Therefore, he refuted the Sufi claimers at that time as well, who just went to abolish the texts and abolish the intellect. But at the same time, he, uh, he made a balance between the reason, the intellect, and the text, and the spirituality. Of that. So therefore, to his academic credit, if Al-Imam Abu Al-Hasan Al-Ash'ari has purified the ilm of kalam from the, uh, uh, the uh, deviation of the people of kalam at that time and, pre and presented it as a pure understanding of Al-Sunnah wal jamaa then really Al-Imam Al-Ghazali is the reviver of the Ash'ari thought and the one who put it in a beautifully academic frame and spiritual soul to it and really uh, the entire Ash'ari school is indebted to Imam al-Ghazali for that. Now as far as the tarbiya and the ethical dimension and the moral dimension of Imam al-Ghazali's uh, understanding, Imam al-Ghazali obviously had uh, many goals in there among them the perfection of humanity. Al Imam Ghazali wanted people to, through his writing and teaching, to rise from the circle of the human, uh, tangible sensation and understanding and analysis to the freedom of the facilitation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you and the illumination from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that you can understand beyond the tangibles and you can understand beyond uh, uh, the what you see is what you believe but it's what you also experience and what you and all these things the perfection of the human being to the sense that you we understand our role as perfect human beings in other words a good Muslim is a perfect human being first also. And that's understanding, rising to the level, to perfecting the level of humanity uh, so that one can go beyond all the uh, imperfections of the self until their, not only their body is nourished, but their soul is nourished so much that the veils, is, that the veils disappear and the eye of the soul sees the reality of, of things not only seeing the reality or things only with the eyes of the head. The second thing he wanted to talk about is the, the tarbiya of this, the self on good characters. Detaching bad, bad, from bad characters, attaching themselves ourselves to good characters. Well, Imam Ghazali made this four things the reason or how we can do this. Number one, hikmah. Hikmah means wisdom. Number two, bravery. And number three, ifa, which means decency and honor, 
and number four just very important things he considered both those those four the pillars of the self the education of the self and the perfection of the self wisdom bravery and then decency and honor when you disagree and when you deal with people and also being just just with yourself and just with everything and that can only happen through purification of the heart with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then that's how it rises the third thing that Imam Ghazali the pillar of his school of akhlaq and tazkiyah was in the um, channeling the human desires in other words he did not see that the human desires were created so they can be uh, abolished no he viewed that the desires are within us Allah created within us but so we can channel them right not channel them wrong so we want to have money that's great but that needs that needs to be challenged in the legal and the righteous way we want to be good we want to be distinguished let's say that desire can be channeled in a way that is positive contribution to ourselves our communities our societies our countries the world as a whole so he saw that does the desires within the human beings are there they're good but the problem is not in the desires themselves the problem in this how we channel those desires the fourth thing that Imam Ghazali talked about as, as far as the pillars of his the school of ethical understanding is the channeling of the energies of the ummah what does that mean it means that we stop wasting uh, the capacities intellectual financial and otherwise of the ummah of the prophet sallallahu in things that are not important but in things that are actually uh, uh, that aim to perfect us as collectively collectively and individually in things that have actually a positive impact on ourselves and a positive impact on our societies and a positive impact on our on the world that was among the important things so the tawji or directing the channels or, or channeling of the energies of the ummah and its capacities the fifth pillar was is to form a balanced personality balanced personality uh, it means comprehensive vision of things it means a spiritual dimension to the academic foundation not only academic foundation but a spiritual dimension to it and therefore he viewed Imam Ghazali that uh, the, in t the ingredients of the ingredients of the human self are three things al wal jism, the mind the soul and the body and he viewed that all of them have to be there to be combined so therefore you have to have the knowledge academic knowledge for the mind but you have to have spiritual exercises for the soul and maybe you have to have sport or moving of exercises for your body everything works together the sixth pillar of the school of Imam Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala in his education and tarbiya and akhlaq uh, 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 and guidance was that the goal in everything is pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you eat for pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you walk to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you talk to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even when you want to get married getting married is not an objective itself it is what to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he made sure that we remember this that everything we're doing the objective of everything is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when you talk to people it's not about you it's about pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that basically with this probably this would be the sixth pillar of the school of the tarbiyah or the education and guidance of Imam Ghazali but Imam Ghazali oftentimes is only remembered as a Sufi and a great spiritual authority while people forget that Imam Ghazali was really a an usuli of the first rank and he took from an Imam al-Juwaini and his words and usul are, are, are amazing obviously he has few books 
in usul as an amazing usuli scholar such as al manhul fi ilm al usul and this is one of his first books that he wrote and he wrote that when he was a young you know energi energized shafi scholar he talked about the ahkam there the ha the wajib the mandub the mahdhur the makruh al ahkam al taklifiyya al ahkam shar'iyya qiyas al tarjih fatwa ijtihad taqlid etc and then he talked about why he favored the madhab of Imam Shafi'i over other madhahib in that book, etc., etc. Then he had wrote, wrote a book called Al Basit Fil Furu'. And basically, it's a book about the fiqh of Imam Shafi'i. Al Imam Ibn Khilihan Rahimahullah Ta'ala mentioned this book when he mentioned Al Basit. He said, Ma sunnifa fil Islami mithlu. No book in Islam is equal to this book. Yani, any, nobody wrote a book equal to the book. Like Al Basit, and he talked about the the, the furur, and Imam Ghazali himself summarized this book Al Basit to a couple of books. He, one time he called it Al Wasit, one time he called it Al Wajiz. So he made two books, a summary of Al Basit. Then he wrote another book called Shifa Al Alil Fil Qiyasi Wa Taalil. It's also uh, in that book he talked about the Qiyas and the Illa and the Muamalat, etc. Uh, or I'm sorry, and the Lalat Al Illa. Etc., etc., Shurut al Qiyas, all these things, obviously, uh, that would uh, help with the people who read Ibn Hazms, for example, Ibtar al Qiyas, etc. And then he wrote, obviously, the very known book and the famous one, Ihya Ulum al Deen. And Ihya Ulum al Deen, as you know, he talked about Aqa'id, he talked about Ibadat, Mu'amalat, he combined Aqal and Naqal, yani the combination between the Aqul and the Manqul, the textual and the intellectual between fiqh and tasawwuf, between nas and istidlal, deduction, etc. Beautiful, great book, obviously, uh, that, that, that uh, we're all indebted to and it's still taught. Then he wrote another book called Tahdeeb al-Usool, and uh, this book is really a huge book in usool, and he talked in detail, which is much more than his two books, Al-Mankhul, he's bigger than Al-Mankhul, and it's bigger than the Mustasfa. Another book he wrote called Al Mustasfa Min Ilm Al Usul. And Al Mustasfa is simply a summary of the Tahdeeb Al Usul. So, but Al Mustasfa is uh, bigger than Al Mankhul, yet smaller than Tahdeeb Al Usul. Uh, you see also Imam Ghazali, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, uh, combining all these things. So his knowledge, extensive knowledge in the academic sciences, and then his extensive expertise and decades of total seclusion only with him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that gave a combination along with his exposure to the Mu'tazila and all the people that were talking at that time, etc., gave a combination to a personality that became this just beyond genius in its uh, delivery of what it thought it was the truth. Al-Imam Ghazali died, remember we said he was born in, in, in the year 450 of Hijrah, and he died in 505 of Hijrah. So about 55 years old. That's all the age of Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala. He was, obviously, he left a huge, massive legacy of books. He was a Sufi of the first rank, according to the basis of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah. He was Faqih. Uh, jurist of the highest rank, and you can see that he was an usuli of the highest rank. The student of Imam al Juwaini, who Imam al Juwaini himself called him an ocean or a sea, and then he was a philosopher who understood the pitfalls of philosophy and corrected them, not simply took what they said and as granted. He wrote more than 450 books, uh, basically. Most of it is still actually only in scriptures, it's not been printed, and or some of it is still in scriptures, and most of it has been lost. So with the school of Al Imam Al Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, we see that he was a personality that combined all these things with one factor that is very important, was the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which were manifested in signs. Those signs were that we talked about, but I'll just say two things. 
Number one, positive contribution to himself, his community, his society, the world as a whole. And number two, the objective and the aim in everything that he said and did and, and wrote was to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with him and that he assembles us all with him under the banner of our Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and that he makes us benefit from this great scholar. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.